Troubles and trials more than enough The way sometimes gets a little rugged and rough But I have this promise He'll go with me all the way All the way Though the valley is dark and dreary, I know my Jesus is always near I'm gonna make it all the way home someday He's gonna take me by the hand I'm gonna make it with his help One of these days And I'll be safe from the other side And with Jesus I'll never abide I'm gonna make it all the way home someday I'm gonna make it all the way I'm gonna make it all the way home someday He's gonna take me by the hand I'm gonna make it with his help One of these days I'll be safe on the other side And with Jesus I'll let it abide I'm gonna make it all the way home someday You know it's singing with us I'm gonna make it all the way I'm gonna make it all the way home someday Christ my Savior Start that again when he gets the sound on. By the way, thank you for coming today. From Fort Payne, Alabama, and the Fort Payne Christian Center. We all at this church love the Kelly family. There's not anyone anywhere, I'm sure, that holds you guys in honor and high esteem higher than us. We love you and you are a part of our family. So here we are, Brother Kelly, I mean, you know, has fought the fight. He kept the faith and now he has already been ushered up into the great place of 
heaven. He sang about it. He preached about it. He talked about it. He loved talking about Jesus. And now he's there. Now, our hearts, you know, we have a mix of bittersweet. The bitter is, is I won't get to sit with Brother Kelly anymore and talk about what kind of pie we love to eat. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times that Brother Kelly and I would be sitting at the table with a group of people and Brother Kelly would say, what are you going to have for dessert? I say, oh, Brother Kelly, I don't know, maybe coconut pie. <laughs> and he would laugh. And then, you know, I won't get to do that anymore on this earth. So that's a little bitter. And I won't hear him sing and I won't hear him preach or I won't sit across the desk and let him talk to me and give me wisdom. But praise be unto God Almighty. He's already made it and I'm going to finish and carry on the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ just as you are, Michael and Sally and the whole family. We're going to carry on. We're going to complete the work of the ministry because he fought a good fight. He kept the faith, and now he's been offered up. Just think, I would have loved to have seen Miss Mary's face and loved to have seen Brother Kelly's face when they grabbed each other and said, I want to stroll over heaven with you. <laughs> it must have been an awesome time. And today, I think about, you know, the, the car, how you packed all these kids in a car, Brother and Sister Kelly, and they would go down the road to a, a church. You know, you thought they'd let you rest, but they took you all the time to church and to church and to church. But just think about the legacy that this man has left. What are you gonna do with what he left you? He took things with him, like his love, his miraculous ministry, his faith in healing the sick. But what did he leave? He left sons and daughters on this earth to do the work of Jesus. As John 14, 12 says, Jesus speaking, the works that I do shall you do, and greater works than these shall you do. And he said in the next verse, ask anything in my name and I'll do it. I believe that Brother Kelly loved the name of Jesus and preached the name of Jesus just like I do and my mom. We love the name of Jesus because there's no name given under heaven whereby we must be saved except that wonderful name of Jesus. So he left the legacy of authority in the name of Jesus. And he said, don't dare, don't dare forget the power in the name of Jesus. Well, I want to say he may be in the cloud of witnesses today watching and listening, but I want to say hip, hip, hooray, Brother Kelly. I'll never forget the name of Jesus and the power that's in that name. You know, the greatest thing I know is to leave a legacy of anointing. And you know, they don't need anointing in heaven. They don't need that up there. So his anointing, it's here. And the only thing we have to do is just move in that same anointing. I'll never forget. One day I was preaching at Brother Kelly's church. He said, Elaine, I believe this is going to be a real anointed service today. I said, I do too. We joined hands. We prayed in the office and then we walked out into the auditorium. As I finished the message that day, there was a lady sitting in a wheelchair. She was crippled. She'd been in an accident. I said, ma'am, Brother Kelly and I agreed that there's going to be a notable miracle today. And you're it. We prayed for that lady. She jumped out of that wheelchair. I left because I was finished. I walked back to Brother Kelly's office, but the crippled lady beat me running and got to Brother Kelly before I did. <laughs> oh, we had a time that day. Well, you know what? I'm so excited about what God's going to do for all of you. Listen, 
I did say it's bittersweet, but let's get over the bitter. Let's say he is with us in legacy and memories and the spirit of God. We're going to do what he taught us to do. And I believe I'm shedding a little tear here. I guess you can see that. But that's okay because tears are a language that God understands. And what I'm feeling right now is that you and I will be what God has called us to be. And we're going to continue the ministry of William Eugene Kelly. Michael, I send my love to you. Sally, you guys are the greatest. Cindy, all the grandchildren, you know I love you with all my heart. So from Ken, my husband, Jonathan and David and all their families, the Homer family, I say, get on with the program. Don't give up, don't give in, and don't give out. Keep up the good work. And William Eugene Kelly, I will see you again. of praise today, church. This is going to be a service that's built on expectation. The environment of expectation breeds faith, and, when, and faith breeds miracles. And I believe that this is a place that's going to breed miracles today. And if you're here today, I, I encourage you to elevate your expectation for the work of the Holy Spirit, because this is a memorial service, but this is a celebration for someone that's gone on into heaven. Hallelujah. And if we're here today, we're going to celebrate in many different waves of emotion. We're going to celebrate with joy. And we might cry, we might shed a tear, but I encourage you to do that if you feel led to because Jesus modeled that at the tomb of Lazarus. And we know that uh, we don't cry for him because we know where he is. We cry for us because we're not with him. <laughs> but we thank God that he's here in this place. I'm Pastor Michael Gamel, and I'm going to be the MC for today's. Well, we're here, and we want to welcome you as we honor and tribute to the life and legacy of Bishop William E. Kelly. And on behalf of Michael, Sally, Cindy, and Brian, and the whole family, we thank you for being a guest here today. And it's our privilege to get to usher you into the Holy of Holies. We want this to be a mirror of what he's experiencing today. Can you agree with me, amen? Amen. So we can experience God. Uh, next, we're gonna have Pastor Tommy Miller come from Legacy Church in New Philadelphia, Ohio, with some remarks. Thank you for being here. Thank you guys so much for having me, Pastor Michael. It's an honor to be able to, to share in the celebration of such an amazing man of God. One of the things that Pastor Elaine said is that he is in the cloud of witnesses. The encouragement that we get from the cloud of witnesses, it says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such amazing people, let us press on, laying aside every weight and sin that so easily ensnares us. I've had the opportunity, my wife and I, the last six weeks to go up every Friday and just spend some time with Pastor Eugene. And, uh, and I felt as I was preparing for this that it would be selfish if I kept the most important impartations that I've received from Pastor Kelly to myself. So what I'd like to do is share the three most moving impartations that I've received from him. And the first one is this. 
He said the spirit has many fruits, but seriousness is not one of them. <laughs> you guys know, right? <laughs> Pastor Michael invited me to share during a, uh, a series that he was doing at the edge called Hear, Trust, and Obey. And when I got done preaching, there was such an anointing on the house. People were laid out on the floor. Pastor Michael went up and he was closing. There wasn't a dry eye in the room and God was moving. And I had the opportunity when I preached to sit behind, beside Bishop Kelly. And Pastor Michael's up finishing and ministering, giving the altar call, and he's crying. And, and he says, what if the Lord calls you to come minister to a cannibalistic tribe? Will you hear and will you trust and will you obey? And Pastor Kelly leans over and says, I guess they would taste and see that the Lord is good. <laughs> Not a dry eye in the room and the man is in heaven. I mean, he's just somewhere else experiencing righteousness, peace, and joy. The second one was this, and for a young guy like me, I'm 31, I've been in ministry for eight years. He said, stay out of the fast lane. He said, if somebody's telling you that technology is going to enhance your anointing, stay away from them. Replace your anointing. I'm sorry. He said, it can enhance your anointing. He said, if it replaces your anointing, stay away from them. He said, what worked 2,000 years ago works today. The church growth models and the new fangled science, he said, it's not going to do it. And this is what he said. He said, we lose sight of the importance of relationships. We tell people that we'll keep them in our prayers, but we refuse to keep them in our lives. We get too caught up in reaching the world that we forget to reach our dinner table and we find the pursuit of divine connections to be more important than father-son relationships in the kingdom. Pastor Kelly taught me that authentic love is more important than Facebook likes. That doing life together is more important than live streaming and that friends are more important than followers. No matter the latest fads and discipleship and church growth, the ministry of your presence and people will always be the most important and the most effective. And the last thing I'd like to share with you is something that he recently imparted to my wife and I and he said these words. He said, you have to bloom where you're planted. He was a man that wasn't driven by circumstance. He was led by the Spirit. And for the last six weeks that we spent with him every Friday, we went to minister to him. And for any of you that know him, you know that that's laughable. <laughs> we walked in the room while he was prophesying over one of his nurses. <laughs> we stayed in the room while he was praying healing over one of the people that came and visited him. And in six weeks, in the toughest times of his life, he never uttered a complaint. He never murmured negativity. He prophesied and prayed for healing over my wife. And I said, Pastor, you know, you can, if you want to, you can, you can have these people care for you. He said, no, brother. He said, I bloom where I'm planted. And as long as I'm in this bed and I can speak, I'm going to preach the kingdom and I'm going to heal the sick and I'm going to raise the dead and I'm going to cleanse the lepers and I'm going to cast out demons. He said, it doesn't matter where you are. You bloom where you're planted. Those have been the most important things that he's left with me. The revelation that I've received from this man is innumerable and invaluable. But I felt selfish if I kept those things to myself. And I want to leave you with this. As I sit here and remember this man, he loved me. He loved me. And I tell you what, honestly, one of the things that I'll miss most and one of the things that I will feel leaving this earth is his love for me. Because it's authentic, it's real, and it's rare. I encourage you, in light of his passing, to spend less time with your face in your screen and more time with your face <laughs> facing your spouse or your church or your family. Less time trying to get followers on Twitter and more time trying to make spiritual sons. Because when you sense a love like that, there's no going back. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you. So often we can remember so little of words that are shared with us, but we always remember how someone made us feel. We remember 100% of how someone made us feel. And there was never a time or a single moment where we weren't with Poppy or we weren't with Bishop that we didn't feel authentically loved. It's so true. I want to introduce Pastor Alan Rasnake, Crossroads Community Church, Columbus, Ohio. If you'd come.
you would have a hard time convincing me. I'm not the most blessed person in this building. On March 4th, 1990, I walked into New Life Ministries for the very first time. It was the March concert night, which meant nothing to me at the time. My wife and I were invited by a good friend to come and hear it. pastor always said, Alan, you're the best at doing funerals. I don't think he ever counted on me doing his. That night, the concert was excellent. The worship was amazing. We were glad that we had come out on a cold March night. I didn't know that my life was about to have a head-on collision with heaven. Sorry. As the concert ended, and my wife and I headed for the door, Pastor Kelly followed us down the aisle. He asked to talk with us for a minute. I didn't know him. I never met him before the concert. He looked at me and he said, he said, God wants me to tell you, don't settle for second best. I said okay and thanked him. We continued back down the aisle and out the door. As we got in our car across the street, I saw Pastor Kelly hurrying into the, out of the church. I watched as he ran across the street, leaned his head into the, our car. Don't forget, don't settle for second best. Again, I said okay. Again, I thanked him. I looked at my wife and I asked, do you have any idea what he was talking about? She said, not a clue. <laughs> Later that same week, my wife and I sat at a dinner with another minister. He looked at us and asked us to pray about becoming the youth pastor of his growing church. I wanted to say yes. I may even have tried to say yes. But all I could hear was Pastor Kelly saying, don't settle for second best. Two weeks later, we attended our second service at New Life. Pastor Kelly came out before the service, and, and like he knew me all my life, he said, do you think you'd like to teach here? <laughs> I didn't know him, but I heard myself answer, yes, I would like that. My wife and I started attending New Life Ministries. We would do anything we could to be with Pastor and Mary, setting up chairs for the next concert night, hanging up Mary's electric can, can opener after helping them move seven times in five years. <laughs> One day, pastor looked at me and asked me to be his co-pastor. For the next 20 years, I had the privilege of working side by side with him. I spent many hundreds of hours riding around with him to hospitals, churches, church members' homes, ice cream shops, and way too many McDonald's. <laughs> many times I w watched as he took the journey from hurt and disappointment to a determined walk of forgiveness and love. It was during these rides the pastor would share his wisdom, his horrible jokes, his dreams, and always his heart. The pastor became my mentor, my Bible school, my partner in ministry, and my friend. In 25 years of serving together, I don't remember many of the sermons that he shared from the pulpit. I remember hundreds he lived out in front of me. Ephesians 4.11 says that, that God himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. I will always be grateful for March 4th, 1990, the day God gave me a pastor, and what an amazing man of God he was. Pastor Kelly, my friend, my mentor, my pastor, you did well. And I didn't settle for second best. Bishop was always first class. I can feel a tangible presence of joy in this room, can't you? It just speaks to the joy that he brought to our lives and the joy that we have in Christ. We're not as those who have no hope. Praise God. Right now we're going to have one of his favorite singers sing a song entitled, Jesus, You're Everything to Me by Jennifer Kelly.
days before dad went to heaven I was sitting there talking with him all of a sudden he looked at me and he said well have you picked out any songs <laughs> and I, I was like I hesitated and I thought he's actually talking to me about his homegoing service I said yes he said well what are they <laughs> I said they're all your favorites he said well why don't you sing some of them now so I can hear them? And this is one of his favorite songs. All I need to do is worship. Dad was all about the presence of God. Not getting lost so much in the mechanical of things, but when the presence of God would come, he would just simply do what the Holy Ghost told him to do. Can you say amen?
to do is worship, just worship the Lord. Come on, sing. All I need to do is worship. All I need to do is say His name.
for what we will do in the grandstand of heaven. Hallelujah. When we get to join Bishop as an audience of one listens in amazement as his people collectively become the united church, the church without walls, and say we celebrate the Lord of glory as he comes. The presence of Jesus in this place. What are you doing today? We're practicing because all we need to do is worship. When moments when our heart is aching and we're separated in this life from the life to come. We don't know how to handle some of the pressures and the grief. We just worship God through it. Because there's two times to worship God. It's when we feel like it and when we don't. Because he's always <laughs> worthy of it all. Thank you, Pastor Deanna Reed, for leading us in another wave of God's glory and presence. All I need to do is worship. My goodness, we're blessed. Woo, our ears are being tickled today, aren't they? This is some incredible talent on this stage and in this room. And I invite you today, don't just be a spectator. Don't allow yourself just to be entertained. Participate in what God's doing. Allow yourself to experience the freedom and the liberty of worship. God is in this place. We want to invite Reverend Harry Schism to the United Pentecostal Church International to come and bring some remarks. Please welcome him. How is it that some people are blessed with so much talent and others wish they could sing just a little. When I was a young man, I was sometimes invited to sing in the choir. But it's been a long, long time since anybody asked me to sing in the choir. <laughs> but I have enjoyed Pastor Michael and the choir and all that we've been blessed with today. After my first wife passed away, I was blessed with another wonderful wife, Sister Helen Stewart. And she was the part of a very, very large family known as the Kelly family. <laughs> so she took me to visit some of her brothers and sisters. And one of the homes we visited was where Eugene Kelly and his wife Mary lived with their family. We had a wonderful time, enjoyed the visit. And the next time I visited this family, there was some sorrow there 
while Eugene was there, his sweet wife Mary was in the hospital. So Eugene took us to the hospital to visit Mary. We sat in chairs. Eugene talked to Mary. There was no response. And I was told later that for four years, Eugene went every day that he could to the hospital to talk to Mary. She could not talk, she could not see him. As far as we knew, there was no response from Mary. But every day, he went to spend time with Mary. When I heard this, I wondered what kind of a man is it that for four years would go to the hospital, sit by his wife, not able to communicate with her. It just seemed to me there was true love in the heart of this man. And I wanted to know more about it. After he became sick with this disease that took his life, I was sitting one morning in my home reading the word. I came to this scripture and as I read it two or three times, I thought here is a good description of Eugene Kelly. Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. He has shown thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee? And then we have three things that are required. Number one, to do justly. And what I saw in Eugene, was a desire to do justly. Secondly, to love mercy. And I found here is a man who knows what mercy is all about. And there is mercy very evident in his life. And number three, to walk humbly with thy God. I never noticed a spirit of pride in Eugene. <coughs> he just seemed to love the Lord and love people. I regret that I did not spend more time with Eugene when I could have. But I did go to the hospital to see him. I wanted to know more about him, to talk with him, and his mind was clear those two days that we spent together. We had the most wonderful time talking about the things of the Lord. I knew this was where his heart was. nearing death. He knew that. He knew that he did not have much longer to live. And he told his wife Helen, I mean his sister Helen, who is my wife, he told Helen, I would like to go home. The pain is so severe. I would just like to go home and be with my Lord. On Sunday afternoon, we were in the last place he stayed, rehab center, I believe it was called. He was there in the bed, his voice now 
was very weak, but he was quietly praying. And then I heard him in a soft voice say, Harry, I want Helen to pray for me. I thought that was so interesting that in his weakness, he would ask for his sister to come and pray for him. She came, she stood by my side, and she began to pray. As she prayed, the Spirit of the Lord moved upon her. And I began to feel that too. And both of us stood there by Eugene's side while he prayed with us. And we prayed with an anointing of the Holy Spirit. It was wonderful. But I knew, and we all understood, that Eugene is ready to go. He is ready to meet his maker. And now he is in his presence enjoying that peace which only the Lord can give. But when we came to be with our family yesterday, we heard of a neighbor, a farmer, who was found on the ground beside his tractor just a day or two ago. They tried to revive him, but at 65 years of life, never know, friends, how much longer we have. The important thing is, be ready to meet your God. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after death comes the judgment. We will all stand in the presence of that almighty judge someday to give an answer. And I know if Eugene were here with us and could speak to us this afternoon, he would warn all of us, prepare to meet your God. I thank and praise you, Lord, for the life of Eugene Kelly that made such an impact on so many of us. Thank you for his faithfulness. Thank you for his truth. Thank you for the anointing of thy spirit on his life. But I pray, Lord, that all of us gathered here at this time will be ready when the trumpet sounds. We will be ready to meet you. In Jesus' name, amen. as he was speaking and we sang a song a moment ago great is thy faithfulness i thought if you were to author the title of his biography it probably would have to be great is his faithfulness because he was full of faith and because he was always faithful to god and god was faithful to him <laughs> faithful to his family and the faithfulness that his family witnessed is something that they would like to share about themselves and so we want to welcome the grandchildren and great-grandchildren several of them to come at this time As the grandchildren of Bishop William E. Kelly, we want to thank you all for coming today and joining us in remembering him. This is just a witness of how many lives he has touched. And I know there's many, many more, but we're so, we're honored and we're so blessed to be his grandchildren. So we came up with some memories and I was elected to speak on behalf of all of us. Because <laughs> I can usually keep it together, but we'll see here, okay? Our poppy, their 
there's so many amazing things we could say about our poppy and not enough time. We all have at one point in our lives lived with him, so he's always been more than just a grandfather to us. So we have put our most precious memories and sweetest moments with him all in one piece as best as we could. Here are some of our own personal favorite memories we made with Poppy and that we will forever keep in our hearts. This one's mine. I loved going home with Poppy and Marmy when I was younger after church so I could go out to eat with them. And then I would wear, I'd put on one of his undershirts and watch football with him all afternoon. And he wouldn't make me take a nap like my dad would, but I'd end up falling asleep. Or when he would pick me up for the sitters that I didn't want to go to, and he would just decide that he could, um, he'd, he'd just take me home and I'd spend the rest of the evening with him and Marmy. I'll never forget how he let me move in with him and Marmy when I was 18 and how it helped heal my relationship with my parents. I love how he taught me all about sports and how he loved for me to give him manicures and pedicures. Those are, I know some people are like, mm, but those times, he'd impart so much wisdom and it was just my time just with him. This is James. It's hard to pin down the best of any specific moments, memories when it comes to Poppy. What is easy is to relay the way Poppy has impacted my life and the way he's shown me how to live. He taught me how to give in to people. Not just money, but with prayer and kindness. Poppy gave everything to everyone. He was selfless. He taught me how to love the way Jesus loves. He taught me how to pray and what faith is. He taught me how to treat my wife, how to love, respect, and honor her. He taught me that things of this world are only temporary and how to set my eyes on things that last for eternity. He taught me how to work hard and provide for my family. He taught me how to be a man. Not only was Poppy my grandfather, but also father to me and my siblings. He took care of my family. He made sure that any of us grandkids never went without. He was a strong person and had so much love to share. He has left an incredible legacy and I'm thankful and honored to take part in carrying it on. Thank you, Poppy, for showing me how to live. One of my favorite memories is when I used to live with Poppy. I would come home from being on tour for months at a time, and we would sit for a bit in the living room and catch up. Then he would look at me and say, you hungry? I'd say, yeah. He'd say, let's go to Grinders, Grinders and get a Pedro's pick. <laughs> but if you ever went to Grinders with, with Poppy, it was a pastor's pick. And then we would laugh and joke for hours and talk about life. Grinders was our spot. This is Jennifer's. When I was little, I would whisper in his ear and tell him secrets that Jesus tells us. <laughs> I will always remember how he would always say, stay encouraged and stay sweet. How he would always ask me to come over just so he could rub my feet and never once ask me to rub his feet. I will miss how he would call me late at night just to ask me how I was doing and see if I needed anything. He was always there to listen and then give wisdom and pray over me. He was the sweetest, most pleasant, and kind person you will ever meet. Seth. I will always remember the late nights that Poppy would ask me to make him a tomato sandwich. And I would make one for myself as well, and we would just sit there and talk while we ate our sandwiches. I loved how he always made sure I had gas in my car, and if I didn't, he would have me fill it up. I will miss the talks that Poppy and I had where he would give me wisdom, even though sometimes I didn't want to hear it, he was always right. I will miss the nights where he would call me and ask me if I was coming home exactly at 11. Then I would get there, and he would ask me to help put him to bed, and then read him Psalms 91. I will always remember watching The Price is Right, Andy Griffith's show, Gunsmoke, and Bonanza with him. <laughs> Don't forget the rifle, man. This is Jocelyn's. I will never forget the story Poppy told me once about how he liked to move a chair in our living room about an inch when my mom would leave every day. <laughs> then he would watch her move it back when she got home. <laughs> because he knew she would notice it had been moved only a little bit 
But then he finally told her, I I'm serious, guys, after weeks of her walking in, walking right across the street to the chair, he'd be like, Cindy, I've been moving that chair. <laughs> Him and I had a good laugh about that one for a while. I will miss running errands with him, with him riding along. And we would just talk about life, God, marriage, and stories from when he was little. He always reminded me to see the best in people no matter what and to always keep my own heart right. He would always tell me to count my blessings and not my bruises. This is Brianna's. I knew if I ever needed wisdom on anything or needed help making a serious decision in my life, that I could always go to Poppy and ask him and always would get the right answer because he was so full of wisdom and that the Holy Spirit, that he knew exactly what to say and how to say it when I needed to hear it the most. One of my favorite memories is when I was little, he would always let me and my sister play with his hair and put clips and barrettes in it while he watched TV. <laughs> Elizabeth. I love that he would always encourage us to love people and how he always said if we needed to talk or if we needed something to tell him. He also called me all the time just to check on me. That is something that I will always remember. How he would take time out of his own day to call me just to see if I was okay and to talk with me. I love that he explained football to me just so I could know what was going on and would be able to understand when we were watching together. And the very last one, is where I went in to see with him. And as I sat next to him and held his hand, he gently asked me if I would just pray in tongues with him. And then Jade, she's the only great grandchild that added something. She actually wrote this weeks before he passed. And she said that she wasn't able to say it today. So I'm gonna say it for her. Dear Poppy, we all loved you and we are all going to miss you, but we all know that you are in a wonderful place now. Very happy for you that you're getting to see Marmee and that you will be with her. I remember when we lived with you and that you were like my dad. I'm going to miss that. I know you might not be here when all of us great grandkids have kids, but you will always be in our hearts. I love you, Poppy, and I'm going to miss you very much. Our Poppy was an incredible man and an amazing example. We will never forget the things he taught us and the special moments we made with him. We will miss him dearly, but we know he is finally home rejoicing and celebrating with Jesus and our Marmy. Thank you. I want to say thank you to the family because as a minister's son, it's sometimes not an easy thing to share your family with the rest of the congregation. But I want to say thank you because you allowed your poppy to become our poppy and your dad to become our dad. And he was a spiritual father to many. So we want to say thank you, family. Thank you for sharing him with us. It is a blessing. In fact, uh, one of the last times I shared with him, I bought a microphone to hook up to my cell phone, and I came in. I probably shouldn't share this, but I'm going to. <laughs> Just to say how great sense of humor he had. And I put it up to his, his whispered tones at that point, and I put the video camera on him. And I got real close, and I said, Poppy, what's, what's some of the greatest imparting wisdom you can leave with the next generation? What's is it I can share with my kids when they come? And he said... If the bathroom stinks, spray the spritzer, but not too much because it can be strong. <laughs> and he always had a great sense of humor, even when he was experiencing his own pain. He saw past it to bring us laughter in ours, and he loved us. I want to invite you to really... Feel free to stand on your feet to worship God as, as we welcome a, a dynamic duo, um, many people to sing the song Alpha and Omega. Feel free to worship. Stand to your feet. Have church today.
Mom and Dad always taught us to find the will of God and then do it with all of our heart. They never taught us that they were our everything. They taught us that Jesus was our everything, that he was our beginning, our ending, and everything we needed in between.
Douglas Miller with the song selection, My Soul's Been Anchored. And following that, remarks from the Re resolution from the Pentecostal Temple Kojic Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Forgive my voice today. I'm not only suffering with a sinus problem, but I just returned from our international convention in St. Louis, singing every night singing hard and I, one night I was sitting there and I just talked to the person sitting next to me and I said to them I'm getting too old for these conventions <laughs> but I wanted to come today and um, show my respects and thank the Lord for there are some people that you meet in your life and after <laughs> after you meet them you wish you'd never met them I remember the first time I met uh, Bishop Kelly, and uh, I consider myself a Kelly now. And uh, yes, <laughs> Amen. And, and I think it was just about 2010, 2011. And uh, he blessed me. And I met the family, and they blessed me. And uh, one day, Brother Mike, Pastor Mike called me and said, we're coming over for lunch. And I began to think, do they want me to cook them lunch? Because <laughs> if I cook it, they better not eat it. <laughs> and then I remembered that there was a little soul food place uh, downstairs in the base of my condo building. So I called them, we came over. And Bishop sat there in my living room and we ate chicken wings. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> and they were so good, uh, I guess he thought I had cooked them. <laughs> but I, I didn't want him to leave there uh, misunderstood, so I had to tell him I ordered them from downstairs. But um, I took them to Pittsburgh to my church and I'm suffering from dry mouth from that medication. And uh, we went in the back and went in the office and he met my pastor, Bishop Lauren Mann. And he, uh, he encouraged my pastor so until they... You know how sinus medicine does, it dries you up. And after, after he left out of the office, um, he encouraged my pastor. So my pastor looked at me and said, you know what? He said, that man is saved. He encouraged it. So, so I just wanted to read um, a proclamation from Bishop Lauren Mann from the Pentecostal Temple Church of God in Christ. It is with sorrow but profound joy that I acknowledge the passing of a general in God's army, Bishop William Eugene Kelly. It has been said that it had been said that one never gets a second chance to make a first impression. Bishop Kelly must have lived by that adage. The first time we met was in August of 2012 when he had some of his congregants of his ministry attended the first convocation after I was consecrated to the bishopric of the Vermont Connecticut jurisdiction. I was drawn to him by his warm, friendly spirit, by his gigantic smile. The anointing upon his life was obvious. 
we instantly connected in the spirit. We were exuberant with the awesome musical expertise of those who accompanied, accompanied him. It was because of the invitation extended through Brother Miller that a new friendship and a fellowship was established in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ between me and Bishop Kelly. Bishop Kelly leaves a great legacy of anointed preaching, undeniable anointing, and und un an unadulterated witness to the unity of the spirit and the bonds of peace. His life has been a testimony that in the words of one of the old hymns of the church, in Christ there is no east or west, in him there is no north and south, but one great fellowship of love throughout the whole earth. As members of the human family, we mourn Bishop Kelly's passing. It will be difficult going on without him and his dynamic presence. His family will miss him far more than any of us. But our sorrow has turned to joy when we remember that the breaking news from heaven, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come and receive you unto myself. The blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless you, bless you in the name of the Lord. Uh, and this is sent by Bishop Lauren E. Mann, pastor of the Pentecostal Temple Church of God in Christ and the bishop of the Vermont, Connecticut, jurisdictions of the churches of God in Christ. Amen. Y'all have to pray for me today. Push me a little bit, musicians. In the key of C.
song I bowed on my knees you're going to del delight in this one followed with remarks from Pastor M. Dana Gamble of Cathedral of Life in Canton, Ohio I knew that this would be one of the songs and dad always sang the first verse in fact I think the last time we sang it was at Uncle Warren's home going and dad sings the first verse and I just felt like I wanted my pastor to sing this first verse. This song means a lot to us because, see, even though we're eulogizing Dad today, every time I'd look at Dad, he'd point me toward Jesus. And I know that we talk about him embracing Mom when he got there, but I can tell you when he entered into heaven that the first person he wanted to see was his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Somebody 
Um, I don't have any socks on. And the reason I don't have any socks on is because it's kind of a, kind of a Kelly thing to do. Um, 
And they, they asked me why I even wore socks. I said, well, I just do. And I just want you to know the reason I don't have socks on today is because I've already had my socks blessed off. <laughs> I'm telling you, this has been amazing. This has absolutely been amazing. I actually feel like I should have bought a ticket, to be honest. I mean, it, this is a concert, but it's a, it's a, it's a, a time of worship. I had uh, the honor of knowing this family for a number of years, um, but it wasn't until the last year we've really become uh, very, very close. And uh, it's just been an awesome, awesome experience getting to know this family. Uh, they are the real deal, and uh, they love the Lord with all their heart. And I, uh, every moment that we spent with them has just been absolutely tremendous. And I can tell you, uh, Brother Douglas, uh, uh, they invited themselves over to my house on Memorial Day, too. Um, <laughs> And uh, we had a great meal together. Um, um, and I will tell you this. If they bring chocolate cake, don't get it on your forehead. Because if you do, it'll make your tongue want to slap your brains out. It's just that good. <laughs> but I can tell you, Bishop Kelly, tremendous, tremendous man of God. He was, uh, in his own way, he was a classy man, but he was down to earth. He was frugal. He, was, uh, he didn't have a lot, but he was generous. He was fun-loving, but he was hard-working. As a matter of fact, I came in, and uh, the television was on to gun smoke, and he said, I don't know why that's on. He said, that should be Jimmy Swagger. Um, <laughs> I said, whatever, whatever you love, brother. <laughs> he was unpretentious, but he was impressive. Um, he's a man of strong conviction, but he wasn't judgmental. He was consistent. He was content even in the last moments of his life. You could sense the presence of God, the tremendous, tremendous glory of God in that room. In fact, the family would get together and sing. I'm telling you, it was unbelievable. People from all over the, the, uh, the whole facility were coming to find out what in the world is going on in here because it was absolutely tremendous. The angels of the Lord were in the room. And I remember um, not long uh, before he passed, I could sense uh, there was a, a changing of the guard already happening. And as the family came in, you could, you could experience, I mean, there was something really, really great. God was releasing not just a mantle, but mantles over this, over this family. And I want to say to every single one of you, on your father's behalf, every one of you have been tremendous through this process. Cindy, just amazing. Seth, you guys just, just taking care of him in the home. All of the, all of the children, all of the grandchildren around him, every, I mean, every minute they could spend with him was absolutely, you guys have just been so awesome. But I, I'm just thinking of, of what a tremendous, tremendous man this man of God was and is in the presence of the Lord. You know, he's shouting on streets of glory. He's experiencing everything that he prayed about, everything that he talked about, everything that he preached about. I'm telling you, he's experiencing it right now. And I want to encourage you today. I don't know where you are with the Lord, and I'm sure that uh, Pastor Michael will give you an opportunity to get it right with the Lord. But I want to tell you something right now. You don't want to miss heaven. I'm telling you, you do not want to miss heaven. Heaven is a marvelous place. About a year ago, I was standing right here with my own father's home going, and uh, I, I remember uh, just standing here thinking about, about him being in the presence of the Lord, dancing on streets of glory, experiencing the freshness of 10 million springtimes. Come on now. What, a, what an incredible, glorious place. And so this passage of Scripture comes to mind, 2 Timothy 4, verses 5 through 8. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. The Apostle Paul's penned these words, and he, he spoke these words, but they bear reference to uh, Bishop Kelly as well. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness with the Lord. The righteous judge shall give me of that day, and not to me only, but to all them that love his appearing. I remember a passage, I think it's in Matthew 24 and about verse 20. It says, I pray that you make your flight before winter. And I got to thinking about Bishop. You know, he told me and he told my mom one time, he said, you know, I had offers to go to places around the world, to fly to other places, but I never really went because I really felt like my place was here, here with my family and here with, uh, 
you know, those who I minister to, he said, but I, I, I really had the opportunity to go. He said, I never flew in a plane. But I got to thinking about that. He made a flight just a few days ago. He took his first flight, <laughs> Pastor Michael, and I mean he flew. And, 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 and watch this. He, he, he missed out on Ohio winter. I mean, he took off just before the snow started to fly. I'm telling you, he, he, he left in style and went into the presence of the Lord. So the one thing that I really know about this man that I would like to just, just in closing say that it really touches my heart about him is that I don't believe that this man ever gave up on anybody. I just don't believe he ever gave up on anybody. He really had a heart of forgiveness, a heart that reached out to people, a heart that loved people even through the midst of their pain. I'm telling you, he just would never, ever give up on people. And so just in, in, in keeping with that thought, if you've been stuck, stung, stung, or stranded by life, no bitterness, no earthly pleasure, and no distraction is worth missing heaven for. You know, you're a one of a, of a kind masterpiece. You're a fulfillment of one of God's dreams. He was dreaming about you before the foundations of the world. And even in this moment today when we, we begin to think about life and death and we think about the importance of life and death, I want to remind you, it's so important that you remember the things of God and you put God first in your life. If you've fallen, it's time to get back up. If you've missed the mark, it's time to press towards the mark of the high calling that's found in Jesus this morning. He would remind you today, if you were preaching, standing right here, that God loves you and that he would never forsake you and that he's calling your name. He's calling you by name and saying, come, come to the master today. And the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. And that's what Bishop is experiencing right now. So, Father, we just thank you for this moment. We thank you that your presence is here right now, that you're hovering and covering that you're surrounding us with the songs of Zion right now, that you anesthetize the pain even in this moment. Father God, that your hand is upon this family. Father God, that you're keeping them and the legacy has been preserved, that the fruit of his ministry continues, Father God, and many, many lives will be touched, bodies healed, Satan stopped, souls are saved. We're reminded that heaven is not just simply a place that the historians and the writers and the authors have talked about. It's a real place. It's a place, Father God, where your glory emanates, where there's no need for sun or moon, for the Lord himself is the sun and the moon. The Lord himself is the light, the effervescent glory that fills that very temple, that place. So, Father, just continue to touch this family. Wrap your arms around them. Sustain them in the moments of pain. Father God, let the memories rise up in their spirit. And let them remember that Bishop is not only in their memories, but he's in their future. For everyone who said yes to Jesus Christ, we will meet one day on the sweet shores of glory together. Let the church say amen. I'm just going to ask if there's anybody in this room that wants a piece of the mantle that he's leaving for us. I want you to go ahead and raise your hand if you say, I'm one of those people. He left a portion of faith. He exercised faith in this world. He saw miracles, signs, and wonders, salvation in Jesus in the earth. And I want a portion of the mantle. Oh, we thank you. We receive a portion of the inheritance of Jesus through our brother that he operated in this life through the Holy Spirit. Father God, we thank you because you're present in this place and you're present in your people. Father, we worship you today. Thank you, Jesus. We want to welcome Pastor Everett Whiteside of Higher Praise Covenant Church in Warren, Ohio. Please come. I guess this afternoon... For those of you who raised your hands concerning the anointing and the mantle, it's not cheap. It's going to cost you. It's not cheap. My um, walk with Pop Kelly, as I affectionately called him, 
is somewhat different from most that I've heard tonight. I came into his life in a different season. I was acquainted with the Kellys back in the 90s. They used to come to a ministry that we were involved in, and they sang like they sang, like they sang, like they sang. But I was invited, I don't know how many years ago, I don't keep up with time as much as I do seasons now, um, to come to New Life at a uh, meeting that they were putting on. And um, after the meeting, I had an opportunity to sit down in the basement and I sat with Pop Kelly. I'm always drawn to senior anointings. It's just who I am. And um, I sat there and I talked with him and then he refreshed my memory that these are the Kellys <laughs> from the 90s. And I was so excited to be reacquainted with them, but I came into Pop's life at a time when he was taking off his warrior king garments and putting on his sage garment. And he was not so much putting out in my life, but receiving from my life. And that sounds strange to some of you, but it was a very vulnerable time when you change garments. He went from the battlefield and the throne being a king to becoming a sage. And a sage is simply someone who's ascribed to the place of wisdom. But when you undress yourself, you need the right people around you. That's good. Because there's a vulnerability that is there. And I came into his life in a moment when he was questioning a lot of things. Michael and myself and Pop Kelly, we would meet at um, Cracker Barrel. That was our meeting spot. And I would try to flip the script every time we met to try to pull from him. But he was always drawing from me. And I came to the realization that this is what he needs in his journey. And um, I can't share everything that he shared with me because he shared some very vulnerable things with me. And I would take them to my grave. But to those of you who are in ministry, I want to speak to you specifically. Because he gave me permission to be me. I'm being, when I went to see him at the last rehabilitation service, a uh, place he was at, he says, you be you. That's right. So when Michael called me, forgive me, I'm not, I'm not one of formality. Pastor Michael, if you're That's struggling right. with that. Um, this is my brother. This was my brother. You're my brothers and my sisters. And um, he told me, he says, be you. So I want to say something to those of you who are in ministry. Find someone that you can be naked and not ashamed. It is imperative that you be and allow your humanity to breathe. Mm -hmm. When he was taking off his warring garments, he became very vulnerable with me, shared things with me. I listened, poured into him, and I discovered that in pouring into him, I was really making more room for God to pour into me. The last time that I met him, he was getting his hair cut. And um, I wanted to take the scissors because I thought I had a better hairstyle for him. <laughs> but I sat there and he said something to him on my way out. All the time that we were ministering to him, he received more than what he gave me, but I was always looking for an impartation. And he said this. He says, it takes more faith to die than it does to live. It takes more faith to die, to transition, than it does to live. I know that messes up the faith theology, but that's a reality. Because when you've given your life 40 plus years to ministry, there comes a time that you begin to ask yourself, was it worth it? Did I make the right decisions? Did I do right by my marriage and my family? Did I do right by God and the people of God? And he says, son, it takes more faith to die than it does to live. And I tuck that away in my heart. I will keep that forever. Michael, I say to you, as I said before, as I was to him, I will walk with you in this family. You have access to everything that's inside of me. The Bible says, except a corner we falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. The season of harvest is here now. The season of harvest is here. And you all will gain because of his transition more than you ever could while he was here on earth. There are some things that don't grow 
until something dies. And he's transitioned. And I heard someone say that he left his anointings here. Yeah, he left them. And they're going to find their harvest in the lives of you all. So think it's not strange. Go ahead and have a good cry if you had to. Listen, don't deny your humanity. Don't deny your humanity. For the first time in heaven, we've got a man, Christ Jesus, sitting on the throne. For the first time in all of eternity, there's a man who's touched with the feelings of our infirmities, representing us. So he understands your humanity. And don't let no religion take that from you. You keep your humanity. And I'm honored to get to know the Kellys. It was my honor to serve your father and your grandfather. I will never forget that assignment that God gave me. Now I'm off my grid, looking for my next assignment. Yeah, I'm a little lost right now. I'll be honest with you. I was teary-eyed coming up here because he meant that much to me. For him to entrust himself to me at a very vulnerable stage of his life. It takes a man of God to do that because we've been conditioned as men of God to hide from each other. Yeah, we become professionals and we are professional hiders. But this man of God right here, he was authentic. He was very transparent, very real, I'm assuming, but very powerful. Never forget this man. Never forget him. God sent him to the earth for such a time as this. And those of you who prayed for his recovery, you didn't miss God. Some of you in this audience right now prayed that God would raise him up. You didn't miss God. You thought that you missed God because God took him. I recall a day that I kept my daughter home one day from school, not because she was sick, because I wanted her with me. And the school called me and said, your daughter's absent. I said, I know, she's here with me. Well, is she sick? No. Does she have a doctor's appointment? No. Then why did you keep her home? Because I wanted her to be with me. That's the only explanation you needed. So God chose that the battle had been won. He had kept the faith. His journey was over. But it begins for us. Amen? Listen, weeping endures for a night, but joy. Yes. Come on, joy comes yes. in the morning. Yes. Joy comes yes. in the morning. And I'm telling you something, Kelly. It's morning time. It is. It's morning time. It's morning time. The things that you talked about and prayed about is going to be realized now. So excited for you all. And I thank God that you allowed me into your home, into your family. I said, heard somebody say they want to be a Kelly. I, you know, I want to be a Kelly too. <laughs> we all Kellys. <laughs> but the reality is, Mike, Cindy, all, all of you guys, listen. Um, get excited. Don't be in a rush, but get excited. Because a wind is blowing. A wind is blowing. It's not going to be something that you're going to have to put oars in the water. No. Catch the wind in the sail because you won't be able to navigate through this one. It's going to blow you. So your only part is that you hoist your sail and catch the wind of God. He's carrying you all in different places for such a time as this. So I thank God for you and um, our prayers are with you. And if you ever need us, all you've got to do is call. God bless you.
with Jesus because he's in love with you I gotta ask you one more time how many are in love with Jesus he's absolutely enamored and obsessed with you he knows how many hairs are on your head and mine come out from time to time that means he's always keeping count he's obsessed 
with you. He loves you. Yeah. That was with soloist Allison Fowler, and we want to welcome a eulogy from Pastor Michael E. Kelly, a man of power, anointed in grace and faith. Come on, receive him. If you have your programs, I'd like you to open them and just look at the top of the second page. I want you to read this with me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Let's read it again. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed. Who did he anoint? Who did he anoint? He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath set me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. This was the verse that launched New Life Ministries. This was the verse that my dad has clung to for 47 years in ministry. I could say so much today, so much has been said. I would apologize for the time, but I'm not sorry. How do you take 80 years and put it even into two or three hours? Aretha Franklin's home going was seven hours long. We're not going to keep you seven hours, just six and a half. <laughs> My wife said, we'll feed them. We don't, I don't think we have to pray that the food will be multiplied. They're preparing it in the back. I don't have a whole lot to say today because my dad would always say, you preach your own funeral. And if you haven't looked around you, just take a look around you. And there were several hundred. I don't know how many came through last night. And my mom... I think we counted about a 1,000 people came through her calling hours. We stood on our feet for five hours. And I just want to thank God today that I had a mom and a dad who taught me the things of God. They not only taught me the word of God, they taught me that the word of God is the last and final say-so in my life. If it's not in the word, I don't want it. They taught me to love rather than to argue. My mother would always look at us and say, be a peacemaker for they shall inherit the earth. My mom and dad were death against gossip. Even when you had the truth, my mom would look at me and say, why are you talking about that? Well, what she'd really say is, do you think we should be talking about this? And I'd say, no. And she'd say, well, then we need to stop. My dad would always say, little minds talk about people, great minds talk about great events. And I want to thank God today that my mom and dad raised me. They weren't perfect, but they loved God. Both of them had parents, both of them had parents that loved God the same way. In fact, many times my mom would go to my grandma Kelly and she'd say, mom, because she called her mom. That's how close they were. I have questions about this. What should I do? And she'd say, Mary, search the word of God. That's where you're going to find the answers. She wouldn't look at mom and say, you know better than that, or you know what we believe. She'd say, Mary, search the word. I'm going to tell you today, if the word of God is not the last and final say so, you have nothing to stand on. And when the devil comes and he blows the winds of tribulation, your house won't stand because it's not built on the rock. So through all the trials and tribulations that our family's been through, and we've been through a few, <laughs> the Bible says that even if we have to go in the fiery furnace, we won't come out smelling like smoke. Hallelujah. 
God never promised us that we wouldn't have troubles and trials. He never promised us a perfect life. What he promised us is that we could have victory no matter where we walk or how long we walk, as long as we walk according to the word of God. So my challenge to you today is this. Are you doing what God has called you to do? Because I don't even want to breathe another breath of air if I can't do what God's called me to do. And I used to build that out of a relationship, measuring my relationship with him on how many things I did for him. And then I found his love. He began to teach me about his love. And he told me, he says, if you'll come all the way in here with me. See, so many times we say the word, the word, the word, and I'm, I'm all for the word. But we forget about the presence of the Lord. And I want to tell you today, pastors, I want to encourage you. When the presence of God comes in, I know today we've had a lot, but when the presence of God comes into your church services, don't shut it down. Let the Holy Ghost do what he came to do. We always have our set list. We always have our agenda. All I'm saying is make sure it's the Holy Ghost agenda. Make sure that the Holy Spirit is getting to do what he came to do. Every time you gather, even when you gather together to eat with someone, make sure that you're not sitting around your table eating the pastor for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I don't know why I'm saying all this today. My mom and dad was real strong in these areas. They always told us, they always taught us how to love. And the one thing that they taught us is they said, you find the will of God, then you do it with all your heart. All of us have had opportunities to go off and do something what the world would call bigger, bigger and better. There's just one problem with it when you get to heaven. Is he going to look at you and say, well done, good and faithful servant? Because I can tell you this, every accomplishment that you have on the earth, it doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter who you are, how big your name is. If you get to heaven and you haven't done what he told you to do and what he called you to do, thank God there will be no tears in heaven because we'd be bawling and squalling. And I just want to deliver you today, deliver this to you today. Find the will of God. Do it with all your heart. Bloom where you're planted. Touch a life somewhere. He'd always tell our visitors, if you've been here longer for five minutes, you're no longer a visitor. You're part of our family. And he would walk up to complete strangers on the street, in the store, in the church house, wherever. He'd just start talking to them like he'd known them all their life. He had a good mom and dad. Why don't you stand? I just want everybody to close your eyes for a moment. Thank you, Father. I felt the presence of God so strong today. Thank you, Jesus. If you're here today and you've never asked him into your life or if you've walked away, and I know... <laughs> Some might even be saying right now, well, you know, I just, that life's a little bit too hard, or I, I, you know, with God, there's a lot of rules and regulations. I want to tell you something. He gives you grace and grace and grace, and I'm not talking about the grace that you just keep on sinning and keep on doing what you want to do. I'm talking about the life-changing grace of the Lord Jesus Christ where he comes. He does not leave you the same. Grace never leaves you the same, but it transforms you. So if you're here today and you've never met him, never met this Jesus that we're talking about, which would be hard for me to believe in this crowd, but I promise God I would do this. Or if you've walked away, Maybe you've even walked away from your heritage. 
maybe things that your family has taught you and they've taught you the things of God and you feel like that's just too hard of a life. I want to tell you something. It's not too hard. What's really hard is when you got one foot in the world and one foot in the church. It doesn't work. It never, it never has worked. It never will. So with your eyes closed, every head bowed, if that's you today, I just want you to lift up your hand. If that's you today, thank you. Just want you to lift up your hand. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Now, I just want everybody to pray with me. For this one person that lifted their hand, I just want you to pray with me. Just say, Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I ask you to come into my heart. I ask you to change me. Wash me in your blood. Fill me with your precious Holy Spirit. And I'll live for you the rest of my days. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why don't you just lift your hands and worship him and glorify him. Thank you, Father. <laughs> Thank you, Father, for your presence. Thank you, Lord, for your glory. Thank you, Jesus, for your anointing. Hallelujah. Father, in the book of Acts, it said that you came and you filled them fresh with the Holy Ghost. Fill us fresh with the Holy Ghost. If those are in here today that haven't been filled in a while, they haven't yielded in a while, just let them yield in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Sobokora babashi. Norabalasiki. Anorabasiki. Norabahasa. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We glorify you, Jesus. We glorify you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Now, they accused my dad of being the preacher that all he did was sing. So, if you accuse me of that today, I'm in good company. On these next songs that we're going to do, I just want you guys to forget about all of these people up here and the musicians. By the way, have you enjoyed this choir and this band? All of them have been connected with us one way or the other. And I just want you to forget who's standing behind you, and I want you to enter into worship. Will you do that for me? How many believe that Jesus deserves our worship today? Hallelujah. Do you believe that today? Let me just wave at me if you believe that. Hallelujah. How many know that when God made salvation available, that the song that the saints sing is not a song that angels can sing? Can you say amen? If you get a little tired, you can sit down. But most of you stand up at football games the whole game, so, you know, take it from there. See you. 
shed the blood of the crucified one. Of the crucified one, I've been redeemed. The Lord has been so good. The Lord has been so good to me. So He's opened doors I could not see. Not see.
no man could number. He said, these are they that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. These are they that are washed in the blood, blood of the Lamb. These are my people. These are they that are washed in the blood. song we're going to do, my dad always said when we do these worship services that it was never complete until we sang this song. So dad, this is for you.
Come on, let's give the Lord one more shout of praise for the life and legacy of Bishop William E. Kelly. Lord, we worship you. We worship you. that those that go before us are gathered in a great cloud of witnesses. Father, but you said you'll never leave us nor forsake us. So the legacy of Bishop Kelly is the legacy of Jesus. It's the legacy of love that lives inside of us. Lord, that greets and meets and kisses with smiles and hugs every person that we encounter. The Lord, we are dispatched and commissioned. Father God, as the church, as commissioners of Jesus Christ, to walk in the legacy that was left of faith. Father, we lay out our hands, lay hold of the garment of Jesus and say, by your stripes we are healed. If anyone needs a healing in this place, lay hold of it. The garment of Jesus is here. We reach out our hands and lay hold of faith, saying it's ours in Jesus, because you purchased it on the cross of Calvary. Lord, we lay out our hands and thank you for grace, Father God, that covers us. Lord, that motivates us and moves us. It transcends in us. And Father God, most importantly, we thank you for Jesus. Because that was the reason. Lord, the motivation he lived. Father God, and he lives in us. Everyone in this room that's accepted your love. Lord, it's tangible in this place and we praise you for it. Lord, we pray a blessing over every person that sacrificed to be here today. We pray the blessings of Abraham. Pray that they be blessed in the city and in the field. When they come and when they go, that they be the head only and not the tail, above only and not beneath. And that whatsoever they set their hands to, that it would prosper according to your will and according to your grace. So bless us now as we go and be with us. In Jesus' most holy name, everyone said, amen and amen.